Hi there, and welcome to our morning Bible class. We are in Judges chapter 19 today. We're going to try and finish the book. We might, we might not. Uh, Just a word of note, uh, this section deals with some very difficult uh, topics regarding... um, regarding sexual assault and things like that. So I'm just giving you a heads up if that is something you are sensitive about. Uh, Let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that uh, we would not do what is right merely in our own eyes, that we would not seek justice merely in from our own sensibilities, but that we would look to your word and your commands for what is good, what is true, what is right, and what is just. Be with us and guide us always. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so these, as, as you recall, uh, Lynn, the, um, the uh, book of Judges is primarily about the judges and this whole cycle of the judges. The great theme in the book of Judges is the cycle of the judges. So people of Israel fall into sin. God punishes them by sending a a conquest. Um, The people cry out to God for mercy. God sends a judge to clean things up. The people are great until they fall into sin again. And that cycle goes on and on and on. Except in the last few chapters of the book, this epilogue. These, um, certainly the previous story, we heard these past, last week about Micah's idol, that took place before the rest of the book. Um, I don't know that, um, when do we, we date this about the same time, also about before the rest of the book. And it deals with um, the tribe of Benjamin and how the tribe of Benjamin really messed up and messed up in quite a bad way, in quite a sad way too. But, um... Let's get started. Um, I'll read for a bit, then I'll hand it off to you, and we'll have a discussion along the way. Um, Chapter 19, verse 1. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah, and was there some four months. Then her husband arose and went back and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back, and had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him, and his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they ate and drank and spent the night there. And on the fourth day they arose early in the morning, and he prepared to go, but the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that you may go. So the two of them sat and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, Be pleased to spend the night, and let your heart be merry. And when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law pressed him till he spent the night there again. And on the fifth day he rose early in the morning to depart. And the girl's father said, Strengthen your heart, and wait until the next day, until the day declines. So they ate both of them, and when the man and his concubine and his servant rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold, now the day has waned toward evening. Please spend the night. Behold, the day draws to its close. Lodge here, and let your heart be merry, and tomorrow you shall arise early in the morning for your journey and go home. We'll pause here. Um, This is a very dysfunctional family situation, as you can tell. So, dysfunctional families are not unique to the 21st century. They're unique back then, too. And you had this... It's, it's tough to say what's going on here. First of all, why did, uh, this, um, why did this Levite... Levite, by the way, is a priest. This is someone who should be held to a very high moral standard. Um, uh, why did... Uh, Why did his wife leave him? Did he and his actions have something to do with that? We don't know. Why did the father uh, want to keep the Levite in his house, eating his food, drinking his wine? We don't know. There's a sense that hospitality was expected, and the father was showing hospitality, but uh, it's... It, we're not quite sure what was happening. Perhaps the father was ashamed of the daughter. The daughter was unfaithful, and the father was having extreme hospitality makeup. We just don't know what was going on here and why this was happening. 
But eventually, um, it was time for him to go. It was time for him to leave, and he said no to the father's invitation. No, I can't stay tonight. It's time to go. And so he heads off. This sort of sets the stage. Um, this is sort of sets the backdrop for what's going on here. Would you please read verses uh, 10 through 15? 10 through 15. But the man will not spend the night. He rose up and departed and arrived back and said, Jim, that is Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddle donkeys and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was nearly over. And the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the nights in it. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Shebed. And he said to the young man, Come and let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Shebed or at Ramah. So they passed on and went away, went their way. And the sun went down on them near the bed, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there and to go in and spend the night at Jebed. And he went in and sat down in the open squares of the city, for no one took them into his home to spend the night. Thank you very much. Um, so, I. Uh, the Israel was a very pluralistic place, as we've kind of explored. The people of Israel were being, the Israelites, the Yahweh worshippers, were being conquered over and over again by, by other nations that had their city-states there, including the Jebusites um, in uh, Jebus, uh, which we'd call Jerusalem now. Um, it's a city that's gone by many names down there. It's a very ancient city. And, uh, and this Levite didn't want to stay there. He didn't want to stay in a foreign city. Um, it's uh, it, it's almost understandable because um, he uh, because uh, the Jebusites are one of those um, nations that would conquer them. Uh, so he said, "Well, let's let's continue on. Let's um let's uh, spend the night at at Gibeah or at Rama. These are two cities that um, belong to my people, belong to the people of Israel." And they um, got to um, Gibeah, near, uh, which was um, the, belonging to the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So far, so good. Nothing extraordinary here. In fact, very run-of-the-mill. You're probably thinking, why is this even in the Bible? It's a story of a dude who's traveling. But uh, we're going to see what happens now and um, how tragic it was that he... Um, that he stopped there. We'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, there, um, the um, and there is an old man who is there, and there is an old man who hus who um, uh, offered some hospitality to him. Pretty good so far. But let's skip ahead to verse twenty-two, Judges chapter nineteen, verse twenty-two. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house, that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly, since this man has come into my house. Do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man do not do this outrageous thing. But the man would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. But this was, and I will use very brutal language here, um, this was a gang rape. And it was um, a horrible thing. There are a couple of cultural things that I think we need to understand. Do you remember the story of, uh, of when the uh, angels of God 
appeared to Lot in Sodom. And uh, the people of Sodom went and said, we want those men, we want those angels, we want to know them. That's biblical euphemism for, for, for sex. And, um, and uh, Lot said, no, you can have my daughters, and said, but don't harm these foreigners. There is a culture of extreme hospitality there. Rightly or wrongly, that was the culture back then, that you would put um, a, someone who's staying in your house, who you are being hospitable to, you would put them and their needs before the needs of your family. We do that to a lesser extent. If we have a dinner party over, we'll let them eat from our plates and do things like that, and we'll have to do the dishes later. But this is not even comparable. And it's easy to read with our 21st century lens into this, um, in our 21st century cultural mores, what's right and what's wrong, but let's lay down a few things that were objectively wrong. It was objectively wrong for this gang of men to rape this woman. That was wrong, 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 and there's no getting around it. And we'll see how wrong it was in a moment. The, um, the, the, the old man there, again, we know him as an old man. There's no way that he, through his own might, was going to be able to defend against this. And it's just a tragic situation that this woman, that this, that this, that this young girl was broken like this and was abused like this. Do you have any comments to make thus far? Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, yeah. Usually, when we when we see when we see things like that, so violation of God's law, and this 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 woman did violate God's law in being unfaithful in her, in her marital vows. Um, violation of God's law, you, we usually see a more direct line to a form of, of punishment, and there are punishments in prescribed in the law of Moses um, for a violation of God, of God's law in that manner. Rape is not one of those punishments. It's just not. Um, a, uh, a woman who is unfaithful in the, law of Mo in the law of Moses, the punishment for that unfaithfulness is not rape. So these are men of Israel, people of Israel, people under the law, who are simply breaking the law. They are not acting for God. They are not acting on God's behalf. They are simply acting as, the text says, as worthless fellows, as worthless people. It can't emphasize enough how wrong and how evil they were in doing this. So I, yes, she was unfaithful, but that unfaithfulness has nothing to do with this. Um, but uh, any questions, any, anything else thus far? Yeah. This is the tribe of Benjamin. Yes, yes. And, and you'll remember, like of Jacob's uh, of um, Jacob's sons, um, Benjamin was the youngest one. Was one of the was the favored one, um, and uh, for his progeny, it has not gone that well, um, and they have really strayed. Um, let's. Um, uh, would you please read verses 27 through 30? Okay. And her master rose up in the morning, and when he opened the doors of the house and went out and went to, go, to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get out, let us get going. But there was no answer. Then he put on her on the donkey, and the man rose up and went away to his own. And when he entered his house, he took a knife and, taking hold of his concubine, he divided her, limb by limb, into twelve pieces, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, Such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the 
people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day, consider it, take counsel and speak. This is um, a tragic resolution to this. This Levite, you can almost see why she left him in the first place, was a cowardly man. He knew he was in hostile territory in Gebeah. He was afraid that that day they would take her again, take him again, put him under threat. So he killed her. He killed his concubine, he killed his wife. And he dismembered her in a brutal way. He's going to try and, a little later on, provide an excuse for this. But no one here comes off looking good. Not the husband. Not the, uh, not the old man who offered them hospitality. Certainly not the people of Israel. The tragic figure here is this poor, poor woman who was raped and then killed by her husband. The Bible does not speak well about this. It's, 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 it's interesting what it says here. And all who saw what happened said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider this, take counsel, and speak. Don't be silent about this, this is saying. Speak up about this. There, where there is injustice, we also are called to speak up about that. Um, it's interesting, verse 28. He said to her, get up, let us be going, but there was no answer. Was this a sort of mercy killing? Quite possibly. Because I'll, I'll note this, and this is um, something to note here. Um, he got home first, and then he killed her in his own house. It could have been a mercy killing. Perhaps, we don't know. But maybe he now saw his wife as damaged goods. Regardless, he should not have killed. There is a commandment, thou shall not kill. He violated that commandment in a brutal possible way. But what he did, he divided her up into 12 pieces and sent them out to, his, to the other tribes in Israel perhaps to let them know what had gone on. It's certainly to let them know what had gone on here. The people were there horrified by what would happen, and rightly so. Horrified of the rape, horrified of the dismemberment. It's, uh, I want to read from the commentary here. Quote, the writer does not clearly explain the Levite's motives or what message accompanied the packages. Given his callousness toward his concubine and his treatment of her body, he shows no remorse but coldly reports the horror that had taken place. The reader, that's you and me, are left to contemplate the meaning of it all and how to respond. This is one of the interesting things about Scripture. God doesn't always give us an interpretation on a silver platter to look at. Sometimes he says to us, um, you've got to figure this out for yourself. We will present what's going on here. We're going to leave this for your own interpretation. Why did the man do this? Why did this rape happen? Why did he send out the package? What did he say in that note? There's a lot that we don't know. But what happens next is uh, really extraordinary, and I don't mean extraordinary in, in a good way. Any discussion thus far? All right, let's continue verse chapter 20. Um, and uh, I'll read for a bit. Then all the people of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead, and the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. And the chiefs of all the peoples of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves uh, in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. 
Now the people of Benjamin heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. And the people of Israel said, tell us, how did this evil happen? And the Levite, the husband, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah, that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine to spend the night. And the leaders of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house against me by night. They meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine, and she is dead. So I took hold of my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed abomination and outrage in Israel. Behold, you people in Israel, all of you, give your advice and counsel here. So it's, it seems through the reading of this text, again, we have this Levite's um, testimony here. Was the Levite being completely honest? We don't know. He is rationalizing this situation by saying, she was, they killed her. She was dead before I simply dismembered her body. The text says that... Um, the text says that he dismembered her. The text doesn't specifically say that he, that he killed her. So um, we think he did. According to this section, at least, this would seem to be either she was already dead or died on the journey, or it was a mercy killing. Does that make a mercy killing right? No, it doesn't. But it does help us to understand what happened here. Um, he was a cowardly man. Maybe he tried to defend her, maybe not. But this is not a good Levite. This is not a good priest. Um, the people, 400,000 of them, got that package and were horrified as to what happened. They went to him and asked what happened. And he explains and he asks for their counsel. Would you please read verses 8 through 11? And all the people rose as one man, saying... None of us will go to his tent, and none of us will return to his house. But now this is what we will do to Gibeah. Gibeah we will go to the tents by lot, and we will take ten men of hundreds throughout the, all the tribes of Israel, and hundreds of thousands, and thousands of ten thousand, to bring provisions for the people, that when they come, they may repay Gibeah Benjamin. Well, let's, let's, let's oh, oh, read the next verse and then we'll pause. Then the people of Benjamin came together out of the cities to Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. Thank you. Um, so, there was going to be retribution for what happened here. And um, the people of Israel, since Gibeah was clearly inept at, at judgment, people of Israel, the other tribes, their kindred folk, would um, take it upon themselves to bring, to achieve and to acquire justice here. Um, ten men of a hundred throughout the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand of ten thousand, lots of people went down to Gibeah to confront them. And so what do they do? They go to um, they, they, go to, uh, they go to the city, they go throughout all the tribe of Benjamin, and they say, give us the people that did this. Not everyone, of course, was party to that rape. They say, give us the people who did this. Give us the worthless fellows that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. The death penalty was an, was an appropriate penalty, according to the law of Moses, for what those men did. And this is how corrupt and how evil the um, Benjaminites and the people of Gibeah were. They wouldn't give them up. They sought to protect their own kin rather than seek justice. This sounds a lot like um, contemporary world 
where organizations and institutions have protected sexual abusers uh, because they were their friends or because it looked better for them. So this is not, this is an ancient situation, but really something that happens even today and something that tragically happens even today. Um, so what happens here? Um, I'll read from verse 15. Any discussion on this thus far? I'll read from verse 15. Um, and the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities that, on that day 26,000 men who drew the sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, who mustered 700 chosen men. Among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, and, and every one of them could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. And the men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of war. The people of Israel arose and went up to Bethel and inquired of God, What shall go up first for us um, to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah should go up first. This is interesting here. This is really interesting here. Because um, the people um, of Israel, they send an army, they raise an army to get justice. So far, so good. They inquire of God what to do. And, and God answers that. This is interesting because God is um, directly speaking there. Um, and um, God says, send Judah first. Is God putting his stamp of approval on what would happen next, all of what would happen next? No. Not entirely. But nevertheless, um, God is saying, it is okay for you to seek justice in this fashion and in this way. Um, they sought God's... Um, they sought God's um, advice again. We'll continue. Verse 19. Uh, by the way, Bethel, by the way, they went, to, um, they went to Bethel. Beth is house and El is God. They went to the house of God to seek um, God's counsel. Then the people of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to fight against Benjamin. And the men of Israel drew up their bat the battle lines against them at Gibeah. The people of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and destroyed on that day 22,000 men of the Israelites. But the people, the men of Israel, took courage and again formed the battle line in the same place where they had formed it on the first day. And the people of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until the evening. And they inquired of the Lord, Shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against them. Again, people of ben tribe Benjamin was plucky. Um, 26,000 men versus 400,000 men, they did pretty well on that first day of battle. Um, but uh, God says, don't lose heart. It's justice is still to be sought. Even if it is against your brothers, the people of Israel were conflicted because this was like, very much like the Civil War. This was a Civil War type thing, brother against brother. A war fought for justice, just as the Civil War was in part fought. And it was a traumatic thing for them. There's no question about this. This was the Israelite civil war. And there would be others down the line. Um, but God says this war is per allowed to be fought for the sake of justice. Any question here thus far? This also, I think, can help inform our ethical understanding of war. That there are some wars that um, are okay to be fought for the sake of achieving an outcome of justice. Um, World War II comes to mind, first of all, because there was a horrible thing going on over in Europe, and uh, justice demanded that that evil be stopped at whatever cost. Well, let's continue here. Verse 24. So the people of Israel came near against the people of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went, out, went against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed 18,000 men of the people of Israel. All these were men who drew the sword. Then all the people of Israel, the whole army, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days, saying, 
Shall we go out once more to battle against our brothers, the people of Benjamin, or shall we cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will give them into your hand. That language there, that word, that language of giving them into your hand, that's very similar to um, what would happen chronologically later on with Gideon's conquest, and what happened beforehand with the conquest of Jericho, um, among other places. Um, so the language is, is, is similar to what we see elsewhere. Um, God promises here. God did not promise in the two previous days that he would deliver the Benjaminites into the Israelites' hands. But God does promise here that um, the Benjaminites would be delivered into Israel's hands. Uh, Lynn, would you please take verses 29 and uh, I'll tell you when to stop. Which verse are you in? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it's in verse 33. 33. Um, Baal Tamar. Baal Tamar. Oh, um, Maregeba? Maregeba? Mar Maregeba. Thanks very much, and we will pause there. Um, this was a total victory, a total and other conquest of the uh, Benjaminites. Um, it, uh, they were totally defeated here, and this was tough for everyone involved, as we will see. The Benjaminites were defeated. They had not given up those men who had gang raped that woman, and um, there was justice and there was judgment that was done. And it's interesting, um, who is complicit in this? Um, just about all of them. Because it was a large group in Gibeah that um, raped that woman, and not one person claimed to know or would give up the people who did that. And so because of that sin, initially of that rape, and then multiplied by um, the obstruction of justice. Um, a lot of lives were lost. There's no question about that. We're going to skip ahead to verses to verse um, 43. There's more battle that goes on here, but I do kind of want to finish the book today. Surrounding the Benjaminites, they pursued them and trod them down from Noah as far as opposite Gibeah on the east. 18,000 men of Benjamin fell, all of them men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimon. 5,000 men of them were cut down in the highways, and they were pursued hard to get them. And 2,000 men of them were struck down. So all who fell that day of Benjamin were 25,000 men who drew the sword, all of them men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness of the rock of Rimon and remained at the rock of Rimon for months. And the people of Israel turned back against the people of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, the city, men, and beasts, and all they, they found. And all the towns that they found, they set on fire. God sanctioned the military conquest of Benjamin. He did not sanction what happened next, the utter destruction 
of property and life and limb and of civilian that happened next. And it's very interesting. That woman who was gang raped demanded justice. Justice was demanded for her rape and for her death. The armies of Gibeah were defeated. The Benjaminites were defeated. But then the people of Israel took it a step further. And they killed everyone. And slaughtered everyone. All the cities. 600 of hundreds of thousands, only 600 remained to continue the Benjaminite line. There's nothing good about this story, is there? There will be some good that will happen next. But this is a strong condemnation um, in Scripture against this sort of military action because there is remorse that will be felt. Um, any discussion thus far? Yes. This yes. part, let me say this quickly, it sounds like they had went out, they didn't take the uh, tribe that uh, God wanted them to have and something for painful. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they did not, the people of Israel did not go out after the armies. They didn't go after those 600 men. They went out after the cities and the civilians. And they're if they hadn't caught the men who had done the rape by that point, there are other ways to catch them, not the wholesale slaughter of everyone there. Um, there are other ways to do that. Not just pe generic people, but their own brothers and sisters, their own fellow Israelites. Um, we're going to um, try to think. Verse, well, let's just take the chapter, verse 21. Now the men of Israel had sworn at Mizpah, now no one, of, no one of us shall give his daughter in marriage to Benjamin. And the people came to Bethel and sat there until evening before God. And they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. And they said, O Lord, the God of Israel, why has this happened in Israel that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? Why did it happen? Because you did it. Because you killed them all. Um, and the next day the people rose early and built there an altar and offered bird offerings and peace offerings. And the people of Israel said, Which of all the tribes of Israel did not come up in the assembly of t to the Lord? They had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord, to Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And the people of Israel had compassion for Benjamin, their brother, and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel this day. What shall, we, what shall we do for wives for those who are left, since we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them any of our daughters for wives? And they said, What one is there of the tribes of Israel that did not come up to the Lord to Mizpah? Behold, no one had come to camp for Jebesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were mustered, behold, not one of the inhabitants of Jebesh Gilead were there. So the congregation sent 12,000 of their bravest men there and commanded them, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, also the women, the little ones. This is what you shall do. Every male and every woman that has lain with a male you shall devote for destruction. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man lying with him. And they brought him to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the canned land of Canaan. So, um, tragedy compounds upon tragedy here. Um, and again, people don't come off looking good here. Um, they, you, you remember earlier on in the book, later chronologically, but earlier on in the book, there was this case where a man, where one of the judges, I can't remember his name, vowed that the first thing to come out of his house, he would offer to the Lord as a sacrifice. And that first thing that came out of his house was his own daughter. 
The book of Judges cautions against these hasty vows and these hasty oaths. People of Israel said, um, none of our wives or daughters, we vowed this to the Lord, none of our wives or daughters will be able to marry a Benjaminite. But they felt bad for the Benjaminites. They didn't want to see that tribe ex extinguished. So they found one small misstep from the camp of Jebesh Gilead. And they said, well, let's solve our problem by killing them and by finding the virgins who are there and by giving them to the tribe of Benjamin. This is not, we have to note that this is not presented gleefully here in scripture. This is not presented joyfully. This is presented as history to describe what was going on. And sometimes history is messy. And history is certainly messy here. Um, and that's what happened. You'll note that um, you'll note that God sanctioned the military conquest of Benjamin. God did not sanction the genocide against them. God did not sanction what happened here. They fulfilled the law in a very legalistic sense by punishing the tribe of Jebesh Gilead. But not in any moral or ethical sense. Uh, verse 13 and following. Then the whole congregation sent word to the people of Benjamin who were at the rock of Rimon and proclaimed peace to them. And Benjamin returned at that time and they gave them the women who they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead. But they were not enough for them. And the people had compassion on Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribe, um, in the tribes of Israel. Any discussion on this thus far? I should stop to ask. No, only that the person you mentioned was Jephthah. Um, oh, yeah, thank you very much. It was Jephthah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, let's continue verse um, 16 and following. Then the elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for wives for those who are left, since, they, since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? And they said, There must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe not be blotted out from Israel. Yet we cannot give them wives from our daughters. The people of Israel had sworn, Cursed be he who gives his wife to Benjamin. So they said, Behold, there is a yearly feast of the Lord at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, Bethel on the east of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon. And they commanded the people of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in ambush in the vineyards, and watch. If the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the vineyards and snatch each man his wife from the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the lands of Benjamin. And when the fathers or their brothers come to complain to us, we will say to them, Grant them graciously to us, because we did not take... For each man of them his wife in battle, neither did you give them, give them to them, else you would now be guilty. And the people of Benjamin did so and took their wives according to their number from the dancers whom they carried off. They went and returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns and lived in them. And the people of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. And they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. I'm going to save the last verse for the last. Um, this whole back half of this chapter is all about the people of Israel covering for their hasty vow. None of our wives will marry the Benjaminites, nor none, none of our daughters will marry the Benjaminites, or none of our offspring. But we want them to have a husband. So we're going to tell them to kidnap, and we are going to kill to get them husbands, to get them wives, I'm sorry, to get them wives. And it's a tragedy. And this is a good lesson. And it's a lesson we see echoed even in the New Testament. Don't make these hasty vows. Don't make these oaths to the Lord. Don't swear an oath to God. Because you're not going to keep it. Chances There's a good chance you're not going to keep it. And then, if you do swear it and you want to keep it, you might go to sinful measures to try and keep it. This, this is presented here as history, as something that happened to explain the weakened state of the tribe of Benjamin. But it is also a good moral lesson for us. If we swear an oath, it is better, first of all, not to swear that oath. 
But then second, it is better to break that oath to God and sin less than to try to keep that oath to God by sinning. Because what happened here is a tragedy. It's a tragic story. As I said, not, no one comes off looking that good in this story. But um, what we know and what we certainly know can be wrapped up in this last verse. Would you please read the final verse in the book of Judges? In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That is a great verse to sum up this book and to sum up this story. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They stopped consulting God. They consulted God at first, but then they stopped consulting God. And look what happened. Look at the mess that happened as a result. So also today, everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, not consulting God's word, not consulting, not consulting what God would have to say. In America today and around the world, people do what is right in their own eyes. It's a great tragedy. The lesson we can learn, again, the moral lesson that we can learn is God's harsh condemnation of rape, first of all. The other lesson that we can learn is God's condemnation of swearing these hasty oaths. Consult God. Consult his word. Live your life according to that. Know that you're an imperfect human being. Know that you're a sinner. And any oath that you make might backfire against you, so don't make them. Instead, where you have done wrong, repent. Repent. Repent, believe the gospel, believe that you're forgiven. Don't go out and dig a deeper hole. That's what happens in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is a book about digging an ever deeper hole. When you're in a pit, you keep on digging. And that's what happens here. Lest, um, lest anyone think this moral, I'm reading for the commentary, lest anyone think this moral chaos is sanctioned by God, Judges closes with this refrain, stressing the horrific consequences of the lack of social authority and the practice of moral relativism. And uh, I want to read from this as well. After the carnage against the Benjaminites, the Israelites began to mourn the near eradication of one of their kindred tribes. They have compassion for the 600 survivors and hope to restore the tribe. So the elders devise a plan to come up with wives for the Benjaminites. These manipulations of morality are final examples of the moral degradation that comes from everyone, do his, do, everyone doing right in his own eyes. God pours out his wrath on sinners, but he saves a remnant by his grace. And that remnant is indeed saved. God is still gracious, a remnant is saved, and the story goes on. This is part of a, the book of Judges is part of a larger narrative of the people of Israel from the exodus to their exile. And of the people of Israel from their exile to their return and from their return to Jesus Christ. We close the book of Judges knowing that this is perhaps not the most fun book in the Bible. But it reminds us of a couple of things. First of all, to repent. The cycle of Judges included repentance. The second thing it reminds us of is, uh, is to consult God's word. Consult God's word. Don't do what is right in your own eyes, but do what is right in the eyes of God, in the word of God. And the third lesson that Judges teaches us, and we see it very much with what we read today, don't make oaths. Don't swear an oath to God, for you probably can't keep it. And then if you do try to keep it, you might sin further. Any further questions on this? I'm curious. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. A gracious God and our Heavenly Father, um, we give you thanks for sparing us where we have sinned. We give you thanks for sparing a remnant of Israel so that the Messiah would come forth. We pray that we would always consult your word when confronted with moral difficulty that we would not merely do what seems right in our own eyes, what seems right to us, but that we would consult the word of God, that um, we would um, listen to him and what he has for us. 
Be with us this day and every day as we continue our journey to the cross where we can find total forgiveness and restoration for all our sins. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Very good. Well, thanks for being with us. We conclude our study of the book of Judges this day. Uh, Next week, we will have a Bible study. Then we will take a couple of weeks off for our in-person classes. I will do some stuff online only during that time. We'll take a couple of weeks off for Easter and for um, the aftermath. Um, But God bless you, be with you, and go with you. Hope to see you down the line soon. Bye-bye.